welcome to Morbid Planet. I'm your host, Erin Chapman. Before we start, make sure to like this video and hit the subscribe button below. Tonight, we have a very special guest. She has published over 60 books and a thousand articles. She has a master's in forensic psychology, a master's in clinic psychology, a master's in criminal justice. She is a professor at DeSales University. Give a warm welcome to Catherine Ramslin. Thank you so much for coming on today. I'm really uh, excited to chat. I'm happy to be here. That's a little outdated though. I don't know where that came from. Oh, Probably. sure. Update me, please. <laughs> <laughs> I have 68 books now and okay. also a fifth master's degree in, in an MFA in, in uh, creative writing. Nice, nice. Yeah, I went on, I think, I don't know, I probably went on about 10 or 12 websites yesterday. And a lot of it was older. And then I was trying to find newer stuff. And that's the last count I saw was 60 something. So I'm giving you a bio. <laughs> cool, cool. So for our viewers that aren't familiar with your work, can you explain to us what you do and about your interests? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Not easily because I've been writing for you know since 19 it's a long time yeah 1988 was the first published book okay and, I've, and so many different things um that currently I mostly write forensic stuff okay um, I wasn't even in that realm at all when I first started writing so mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't even thinking like that. I, I wasn't thinking I was going to teach anything like that. There's nothing on the horizon about me being, you know, an international expert on serial killers. <laughs> so, yeah. So, a great deal has changed and evolved in my life and in my work. So it's very hard to kind of encapsulate uh, how, okay. how to explain what I do because, and I'm always ready to change. That's the thing. Cause you, if you want to stay alive as a writer, yeah. You know, without without a distinct brand, then you have to always be ready to break the frame and you know transition to something else. That's okay. I've got a lot of questions pertaining to the stuff you've done, so that's okay. good. Um, so I like to go back really far with everyone just to start, and I always like to ask, what were you like as a kid? And did you start writing like when you were a little kid? Because I know some people have, or some people did more creative things. What were you like growing up? I was more of an artist and an okay. athlete. But then I broke my arm and leg and that ended the athletic aspirations. Um, and, but I did learn that I could draw with my left hand and right hand. So, so oh, wow. that was helpful. But still, when I was 15, I wrote a thousand page novel by hand. No wow. typewriters, no nothing. I hand wrote it in a few months. Yeah. And um, so apparently I was a writer without realizing or aspiring to be by any <laughs> means. But still, then I didn't do really much of that for years. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think I had different interests as a kid, but I was always adventurous, mm -hmm. always ready to explore. One of the things my mother said was, she, you know, she couldn't find me. I'd always be wandering off. Uh, befriending animals, doing, you know, finding things. I was curious and I've always been led by curiosity. That's, I think learning is my major motivating force. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I get that. That's totally good. And it sounds like you've got that creative thing going. Like when I was a kid, I did so much art and then it's just kind of morphed over the years into different things. So okay. Um, I've read that after high school, you apparently hitchhiked across the country until you took some courses at Northern Arizona University, where, to quote the article, it said you fell in love with learning. Can you tell me about that experience and what courses did you take that sparked this love? <laughs> you did do some research. <laughs> I like to dig around and, you know. <laughs> when I was, when I graduated from high school. The yeah. first thing I did was hitchhike across the country. This is before the motorcycle. Yeah. I hitchhiked across the country to Wyoming and got a job in Somerset Theater uh, and did that for a little while and then ran out of money. Went, went back to Michigan where I grew up, did some work, bought a motorcycle. Uh, five days later, there I was again. You're gone. Riding, riding, got to Oregon. 
um, and stayed stayed there for a while, then went to Arizona. Okay. And I some friends, and they were going to college. And this is three years from high school. And at high school, I said I would never ever go to school again. <laughs> now, here, here I have five graduate degrees. What changed? It was the first class I took. I, I decided since I was visiting friends and they were all taking summer courses, mm-hmm. well, I'd take one too. And I, it knocked me out because it was a philosophy class. Oh. It changed my life and I couldn't get enough. And I began to take class after class after class, still without really a goal in mind of graduating. And, you know, the mm-hmm. way school approach college but remember I'm I'm out three years and now I'm back and I didn't have any framework or any high school counselors or anybody telling me what this is about yeah all kinds of classes so I ended up with I think two majors philosophy and psychology two minors (laughs) and and um, just kept uh, going with it and I loved it I loved everything about it so it was weird to have changed from want nothing to do with school yeah to like I, I just could not get enough just that's not. amazing that's a good story and most people in regards to writing itself that I've talked to they have like that aha moment when something in their life just pops to them and then they get into writing a certain subject what was the first one that popped to you? Like, I know you were talking about when you wrote that one, the thousand page one, but what, it, what was like it later in life? Was this after you did a lot more writing after school or did it start during school or? It, well, you know, during school, I always overwrote. <laughs> they assigned a five page paper. I wrote a 50 page paper. Yeah. <laughs> they came to expect that from me. It's kind of called hypergraphia, although <laughs> it's not, I use it for, for uh, you know, productivity, but mm-hmm. I always way overdid it. I always took you know, 20 to 24 credits every semester, every summer I went to school. There was yeah. never enough, and I was putting myself through. So I had to also work. I had jobs as well because I didn't have any parents paying my way. You know, it was all, my, all me. Yeah, that was fine. Uh, um, I benefited a lot from it. But it's funny because I've actually written a book called Snap, Seizing Your Aha Moments. So I've got a whole book just about that experience. Nice. And I would say it was um, my first book was on Kierkegaard. And it was based on my dissertation in philosophy. Mm-hmm. And I thought at the time, if I ever have to write another book, uh, I'll kill myself because <laughs> it was so like pulling, you know, academic writing is so passive. Yeah. You know, and, and then I wrote, um, then I wrote a different book that was more for students, but then I wrote um, Anne Rice's biography. So that's a commercial book with a very different approach and very, you know, still, uh, still a lot of immersion, but it was so, such a different experience with the Mm -hmm. process and the writing of it, that I would say that would be the one that popped for me that now I want, I do want to write. And you I, got and the bug at that point. Yeah, it was funny because between the Kierkegaard book where I never wanted to write and between the Rice book where now this is what I want to do. It's kind of like school. I never wanted to go back to school after high school, but once I hit college yeah, with some life experience, I mean, I hitchhiked across the country, rode a motorcycle. I mean, I had a lot of life experience. That really helped me get a better sense of what I wanted to do or I wanted to go. So once it, I moved into that groove, it was very clear that, mm-hmm. that as long as I'm learning while I'm writing, I want to write. But if okay. I'm writing stuff I know, I don't want to write at all. Yeah. No, I get that. Because it's just, it's not the same thing. And I know I've tried my hand writing fiction because I'm currently writing something. And then I've done actual articles And it's such a different animal. It's like the fiction, I have to be in the mood to do it. The other stuff I can just plow through and I can do it. So yeah, it's, it's definitely different. I mean, with fiction, I, that to me is the, is the beating heart. Oh, okay. I love fiction. Yeah. Um, I'm writing a series right now. Um, But I also like narrative nonfiction because it's so fiction like, but you're Mm -hmm. still you're still within the frame of what's what's actual and, the, and, and factual, 
you have to stick with that, but there's a lot of creativity in that you can do. Now, if I yeah. were writing an encyclopedia entry, which I would totally avoid, <laughs> um, that would then I would not like writing as much. And especially if I have to write something that I already know and I'm just writing it to for some purpose. Yeah. That is so boring. And I really, I really have a hard time powering through that. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I know talking to Gordon Melton about that because he does his vampire encyclopedias and right. I, in, I interviewed him the other month and that was one of the huge things I was asking was about the process to write the encyclopedia and it's just it's massive it's so massive so yeah well I wrote I wrote some encyclopedias with the Anne Rice stuff as well but yeah. it was always it was more fun because I was exploring much of that stuff like I went to Scotland and England and, you know, I went to some of the places to see what things were like rather than, mm -hmm. rather than just writing from research, I was going and doing stuff and seeing what, what would this feel like to be here as yeah. Lasher or Lestat or any of those. So, so that actually led me into what would later become um, in this immersion journalism that was even a lot more fun. So, so now when I write any kind of nonfiction, I want to go to a place to experience something and write about it from that. Or if I'm writing a biography, for example, I really want to immerse very much in that person's life and go where, mm -hmm. they, where they were and see things from their point of view. And uh, I think that brings a lot of dimension to, to yeah. at least my experience of writing. It does. And I think it gives the reader such a better experience as well just you just get a huge picture and it's just more in depth as opposed to just you know I looked it up online but no you were actually there so no that's cool well you know there was no online when I first started writing so <laughs> you couldn't do that <laughs> I remember when I was a kid that you had to go to the library and you had to look up these little cards to right. find books so I remember doing that but yeah we got the internet I guess partway through high school so that was like a huge novelty because otherwise yeah we had to look up the cards so yeah. yeah and continuing on your educational journey then since we were talking about how you fell in love with um learning can you just tell us about uh briefly touched on it in the intro but about all your I guess degrees and everything that you have mm -hmm. right now and just which schools did you get them from well, I, it was Arizona that started the process. I went to Flagstaff to meet some friends and I got a degree in philosophy and psychology and an undergraduate degree. Okay. Uh, from there, I jumped over to Pittsburgh to Duquesne University to get a, a master's in clinical psychology. Okay. I, I really did not like being a clinician of any kind because I don't really want to sit and listen to people with their, their problems. I wasn't a problem solver in that respect. So I went back to philosophy uh, and got a degree, a PhD in philosophy from Rutgers University. Okay. And then um, I started writing, I think five years I wrote without, go, you know, doing, I was probably teaching part-time mm -hmm. writing. And then I went, I had this opportunity to go uh, to John Jay College of Criminal Justice for a forensic psychology degree. And this is before this is a big popular subject. It was just something yeah. I, I kind of stumbled into. And um, my husband had left because he couldn't stand the writing and all this stuff. So <laughs> goodbye, you know. Um, and so I had this freedom to do, to pursue something else, something completely different. And I wanted to get out of philosophy. So I went I did that degree and that changed my life completely because I was writing for the court TV website. Okay. And suddenly uh, all of the stuff became highly visible. And because I was online, mm -hmm. I became like an expert for many of these documentaries. And then I got and I, it's the university where I currently teach and am the assistant provost now wanted to start a forensic psychology track in their site program. So oh. I was to create the whole thing myself. Wow. And while I was there, I then also got a, a master's in criminal justice because mm -hmm. that was part of my, my benefits is tuition. And then I recently, just this past May, got the master of fine arts in creative writing. Wow. Um, wow. I've had a great time. I, I think you're the most educated person I've ever met. 
I met someone once that had a couple PhDs and I was like, wow, that's good, but you've got so much. That's amazing. Well, and that's the thing about, about reframing your life is each of those degrees is so distinctly different from one another. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not degrees all in the same field or going in the same direction. Each has its own thing, but each has opened a door for me into a whole new world. Yeah. Um, and that's the exciting thing is that each, each time I get something like that, a new opportunity comes along and I, and my whole life has just shifted. It's like, almost like you've, you keep evolving and have these different stages and it's awesome. just like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. One of the, one of the things I worked on in the, during the MFA, which took two years was I wanted to create a novel series. So I worked with my mentors in the program and now I've sold that series to a, to a publisher. So nice. that's what I'm doing next. That's cool. And speaking of what you were talking about earlier with Anne Rice, um, so I understand that you're a fan of the vampire genre, as I've done a bunch of research and, you know, looked into it. And I didn't realize before I started looking into it that you had such a strong connection to Anne Rice until I started looking. And I saw that you wrote Prism of the Night, a biography of Anne Rice. And then there was other books that I saw. There was the Anne Rice trivia book. There was the Vampire Companion, um, which is funny because... I owned the Vampire Companion years ago. And until I saw the cover when I was looking it up, I was like, I didn't realize you wrote it. <laughs> Cause nice. I had it. Cause it, you took it apart and rewrote it and revised it. So because I was an Anne Rice vampire, you know, fan and I found her books when I was in high school. And I saw there was the Anne Rice Reader, the Witch's Companion. And I'm sure there's so many more that you've done. How did this literary relationship come about? Like, were you a fan? Did she approach you? Did you approach her? How did I this? Her. Okay. Uh, I read, um, I guess it was a third vampire novel, The Queen of the Damned. And yeah. I was teaching philosophy, philosophy and literature at the time that I read that it was very much like some of the themes I was working on. Okay. And I thought, this, is, this is pretty interesting. Who is this person? And I couldn't find very, again, no internet. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't find much on her. And I thought, well, why don't I just write a biography? How hard could that be? <laughs> <laughs> so, at, first of all, yes, writing biographies are very hard. Yes. Uh, but secondly, that was, that was um, a pretty bold thing for me, but I called her up. Okay. And this was before she had multiple people working for her and she answered the phone. Yeah. And yeah, I, I had two books published at the time and, and she didn't really know what to say to me. And by the, she, she told me to, I think it was to call her back next week, or whatever. And by the time okay. I talked to her again and she was about to say no, I already had a proposal. Okay. And she had just given an interview. I think, I don't know which, what magazine, basically saying people should be supported in following their passion and and I said, well, so all I want you to do is look at the proposal. If you don't like it, you know, I will never bother you again. But since you said that, yeah, <laughs> I'm asking you just to give me the, sh the shot at doing this. And, um, and so seven books later, I did, wow. I did that. It worked. And I, I, my theme in life is really, it's better to be told no than to lose an opportunity you might get if you ask. That's so true. I always do the same thing with Dean Koontz. I just walked right up to him. Mm -hmm. I said he'll never do anything. He won't do a biography. He said, no, to everybody don't even bother. And I thought, I'm just going to ask. And I got one. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I saw that class. too. I was amazed when I saw that one. I was like, oh, and I, as I was looking at different sites last night, I was like, Ann Rice. I was like, Dean Koontz. I was like, oh, there were so many that I didn't know. Because a lot of your things I know more for the forensics and the serial right. killers and things that I'd saw. <laughs> so which is what made me dig even more last night. I was like, oh, there's other things I have to keep going. But you um, know, the rice stuff then yielded the science of vampires. Um, I actually, I have that. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> yes, I have this one. So, All right. uh, so I did that. And I went and piercing the darkness where I went into the vampire subculture for two years. And that led to cemetery stories and 
you know, the uh, ghost mm -hmm. investigating the side. So all of those were kind of a, an offshoot of all the work I've done with, with both Rice and Kuntz. Oh, I've got some questions on those too. So, okay. <laughs> um, and then with like the, besides the Anne Rice focus books, um, you've written, as you were just saying, the science of vampires, piercing the darkness, uh, undercover with vampires in America today. I've read that the books, um, that a lot of people promote you to a vampire expert in the genre. And when each of the new latest vampire crazes emerged, you're always approached and dis to discuss the subject. So what are your thoughts on the dwindling franchise? And I say dwindling just because they've been around for a while is like the Twilight franchise, the Vampire Diaries, True Blood. Um, I feel that they've all had such an effect on the genre and the levels of fandom that we now see. But how do you think fandom has also changed over the years? And were you a fan of any of these shows or books? I can't imagine why any vampire would go to high school, period. <laughs> I know, and it's so popular because they all do now. <laughs> um, I was not a fan. Of okay. I had a hard time making my way through it. I didn't finish. So um, watch the movies, still not really a fan. Um, I, I don't know. I, because I did all this stuff two decades ago, more mm -hmm. than two decades ago, when people approach me now, I, I usually turn it down because okay. I have not followed all the ins and outs. I mean, I kind of stopped doing that after the Science of Vampires, which came out in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, I know that it has changed. Um, what, what can I say except not my vampire? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, <laughs> there's certainly, and I talked about this in Pierce in the Darkness, there's certainly a resonance for me uh, of the vampires I grew up with, you know, mm -hmm. reading Dracula, watching those movies, uh, even at the Anne Rice books that were at, at least captured the essence of the vampire. Yeah. Uh, and I knew it. And then as I saw people start to make it much more elastic and stretch it into all these other kinds of concepts um, because they wanted it to serve other purposes, mm -hmm. I, I got bored. And, and I just, I didn't want to go there. And that was not my vampire. So I, I didn't go there. And that's why I don't feel like I can really address the evolution of that, of okay. that genre, because I don't read a lot of those things, you know, anymore. I really, I'm so in forensics now that I almost exclusively do that. That's okay. I figured I would try and I'd see. Um, I know same thing it's like with the Twilight books and everything like I read it almost like I always tell people as a research project because I wanted to see what the hype was I wanted and it was yes the books are not good <laughs> and the movies are not good but what I guess intrigued me was just the level of fandom um, I actually wrote like a 12,000 word article a few years back because I went to Forks because I'm so close and I drove out to Forks. I interviewed the mayor. I interviewed all these different people and it was a really cool experience. I, I stayed in a Twilight themed hotel room. <laughs> no, no doubt. <laughs> so that was what attracted me to a lot of it. But yeah, it's definitely different now. And like when I first got into vampires when I was younger, it's Anne Rice, the vampire Lestat. I, I just picked it up at the Louis, library at school. Louis. Yeah. <laughs> Louis and that's me. what got me into the vampires because like I liked horror stuff, but that is what led me into it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when I look at that just in the past 20 years, then like we've got now, it's like everyone's in high school and yeah, it's it's all different. But I just don't get that. Why would you waste your time doing something so mundane? Well, you've been alive, you know, a hundred years yet. Like that's one of the things in the Twilight movie. I don't know if you remember. And then they've got this, they sit on the wall of their, I guess, house. And it's all the little caps for them graduating over the years. And they're like, it's an inside joke, but that's how many times we've gone to high school. And it's like. Well, I still find even, it's so aspire to something else. You can collect other things. Why that? It's so, so silly to me, but yeah. that's my opinion, not my vampire. Yeah. Okay. Hashtag, hashtag not my vampire. <laughs> and 
And I also read that back in 1997, you attended a party in New York that had about 800 people there that claimed they were vampires. Can you tell me about that experience? And back then, were you heavily involved in the vampire community at that time? Or was it just strictly for like the research and book writing? Oh, no. What happened is a a woman, Susan Walsh, was exploring the vampire subculture in New York and she disappeared. Okay. at the time I'd finished the Anne Rice related books and I was having lunch or something with my agent and, I, and he said, I bet you could get in that community and find out more stuff about her. And that led to my first immersion journalism. I, I ran around New York and then other places and that's mm-hmm. what ended up being Pierce in the Darkness because uh, that was one party I went to. I met a born again Christian vampire entrepreneur named Todd who called himself Father Sebastian. Yeah. He's still around doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah. In fact, I usually just refer everyone who wants to know about the vampires to him. Yeah. (laughs) So so, um, he then made me a set of fangs and uh, I I went shopping, which was great. It was tax deductible to get all these really cool velvet clothes and whatnot. Um, and went to these parties and one of them was that big uh, I think it was the Valentine's Day vampire ball as I recall okay it was pretty packed and you know I met a lot of the the key players in the New York vampire subculture um Susan Walsh was not harmed by any of them in fact one of them was her boyfriend so um, okay that was just this kind of newspaper hype yes she disappeared but probably had nothing to do with them Mm-hmm. So, so meeting them, uh, getting their stories, going other places. I went to Paris, I went to London, um, went out to Vegas because there was a vampire magician there. I went to Houston and California, a variety of places, just getting people's stories so that I could kind of see what was this subculture about. Mm-hmm. And that was a blast. I had, a, I had a good time. And in the process, I ended up stealing a haunted ring from one of these vampire people. And uh, that led to the next book, Ghost. Wow. Okay. Um, In regards to the vampire community, so I've done a bunch of research in that. And back in 2019, I actually did a survey where I talked to 73 people, asked them 151 questions pertaining to drinking blood. And for all our viewers that don't know, a sanguinarian is someone that drinks blood Uh, human or animal, and they experience notable health benefits. So I was wondering, what are your thoughts on this? And have you ever looked into that topic before while you were looking into the vampire community? Or is it something that you just haven't? Oh, sure. I mean, I'm a sanguinarians and maybe they got health benefits. Maybe they didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, know, people mostly get sick out of drinking blood. Um, But there was a difference between them and the energy vampires who yeah. seem to never be able to actually prove anything. Um, like they, they would claim they could suck all that energy out of any car engine and, you know, shut it down. But, but then on the day when I asked them to do it, they had a headache or whatever. Yeah. You know, so, so lots of claims made in the vampire community, most based on fantasy, uh, few ever corroborated. Um, so you know, okay. that's what I was finding out. A lot of this was really about people's imagination, which was great. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the beautiful clothing they came up with. The, the and the role, role play. And a lot of LARPing uh, for, as part of this. Um, and I went on some live action role plays in, in really interesting places. So different, different people doing different things in different cultures in different countries. And that the point of the book was simply to explore what was everyone saying? And it was just as the internet was beginning to come on. So there were chat rooms and nice like that, that were, that were forming. And and so a whole nother world because people were play acting in the chat rooms Mm -hmm. and it's hard to distinguish, you know, they, at that point, people were really learning how to be completely deceptive about who they were (laughs) and nobody could tell. So they could, they could do an awful lot if they were very imaginative. And I mean, that's really what I found is a, a great deal of imagination yeah. in this community. And it was, it was really a good way to express it. 
your book must have done really well then when it came out if it was just on the cusp with like all the chat rooms and everything else well, it would have been, it would have if they, if my publisher would have you know supplied it to all the various bookstores. I went <laughs> and talked. There are many times I'd get to a bookstore and no no books there. Oh my god! You know, I, you know, wow! I don't even want to get into the publishing world. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it did it did well, but it wasn't what it could have been because the publisher was lagging. Okay. Even though they had an idea that this was going to be big, they mm -hmm. just didn't print enough copies they didn't get things shipped they didn't support oh. a lot of it and that was unfortunate okay the um, right books did well I mean the vampire companion was probably the best seller of the of my whole vampire corpus that was probably the best seller well and that's like back in the day when I saw that it was like I have to have this <laughs> like I even back then I remember because again no internet was I don't remember where I even found it, if it was in the back of one of the books, but I joined the vampire, um, the Anne Rice vampire club that they had back in the day. And I remember I was so excited because in the mail, I got stuff and I was like, you know, stickers and a letter and all these different things that I got. So it was really cool. The parties that they threw were fantastic. Yeah. So, and besides vampires, how you mentioned earlier, um, you also have an interest I've read and you talked about a little bit with ghosts. Uh, apparently you've spent a number of years researching the subject and you've done some ghost hunting yourself. Can you tell me about this? And did you ever manage to see or experience a ghost firsthand? I, I'm a, I've concluded that I'm a ghost repellent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because everywhere I go where people experience things nothing happens for me you got and nothing nothing zero oh, oh um, my god but I still look I'm still looking and I have written a lot of books on so I did ghost investigating the other side where I like the vampire subculture I went around the country with various ghost hunters and this is just as they're beginning to use digital stuff yes very, very early in it so that was the late 90s 1990s Okay. And, uh, I also wrote a book, Haunted Crime Scenes and Paranormal Forensics. That was a little bit later. And that was with Mark Nesbitt, who runs the Ghost of Gettysburg organization. And so he's, he's a character in Ghost. And then we became friends. And I've done a lot of the, the ghost hunting activities were with him. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm determined eventually I'll see a ghost even if it's my own ghost when I die <laughs> one day I will um you know my mother passed away last year and she knows I want to see a ghost so she was gonna help with that and I haven't seen her yet and nothing so far <laughs> no. and all the mediums tell me or not all of them but a number of them say I have this entourage of of ghosts here some of which are serial killers and so the other ghosts don't want to be around me they're chasing off the other ones <laughs> so, and, they're, and supposedly they're talking to me and I'm like well they better speak up because I don't hear them you know I like so, that you have an entourage <laughs> you have an entourage and maybe I do I don't know but at least I know they're not doing anything I even lived in a haunted house where just about everybody who came in had an experience but me Oh my God. What what kind of experiences did they have in the, the house? The experience I had was this. So I bought this house. And this is about maybe 14 years ago. I bought this house. Before I put my furniture in, I'm standing in the middle of the living room and has three doors. And okay. when they open, there, there's a chime that, that sounds when any of them opens. So I'm standing in the living room and I hear the chime. But the living room doors there it wasn't the one the kitchen doors on the back it wasn't the one and the only other one was locked okay so then I heard that uh the guy who sold to me said well you're the perfect person to have this house because <laughs> we've had experiences in that hallway and so and so um other people who came like my father for example mm -hmm. was supposed to be there three nights he ended up not doing that because <laughs> Um, on the second night there, in the morning, he said, why, why are you up working on your computer? My mm -hmm. office is right next to the guest room. I said, I'm not. What do you mean? He goes, I, I've seen you. I've seen you two nights in a row sitting on your computer working. 
when I get up to okay. use the bathroom. I'm like, no, and your hair's braided. I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> that is not me. Wow. Uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, who's a, a she wife. was a friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so she stayed in the guest room. And she told me I had a ghost cat and something else that she had she had experienced. Oh. And then I had a friend who was a detective. And we were sitting out on the deck one night, and it was dark, but I had the hall light on, and he could see in, and he jumped out of his chair and said, "Someone just crossed the hallway." So everyone has seen something. Everyone, yes. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so, and it turned out the story seems to be that the man who built the house had built it for his son and daughter-in-law. Okay. He was in an elevator accident. Oh. So it could be that he liked having me there because I improved a lot of things that the former homeowner had kind of ruined. Yeah. You were and favorable to them. <laughs> so maybe I was favorable, but nevertheless, he certainly knew I wanted to see him. Yeah. And that didn't happen. And then I moved into an old historical home. I had the whole second floor. Everyone on the first floor saw the guy. <laughs> like, I want to see. Maybe him. you are a repellent. I, I am <laughs> a repellent. Yes. I've, I've been in many haunted houses by myself. Lizzie Borden's house all by myself. Oh um you know a number of places and it doesn't happen for me that's crazy like yeah. I know we've that's had it. I want to say where we used to live before here was I had two things happen and I never actually saw anything but I couldn't explain what had happened besides there being a ghost or something and we found out after that I guess the person who was there before us had died at the place but yeah. it was everyone in my immediate family has seen or experienced something but me. Yeah, it, it was weird. And we've had something in this house too. I didn't see it, but my other half, we'd only lived here about a month. And I remember he was sleeping and I guess he rolled over and was awake and he freaked him out because he thought someone had broken in. But he's like, as clear as day, there was this guy standing there watching you sleep. And he's like, he just saw I was looking at him, looked at me, and then just kept going back to watching me sleep. And then within like a minute, he's like, it was just gone. And he was just yeah, like, I'll take that. Because like, I, he's I, not a I, ghost I, person. <laughs> I have, a, I have a, a line in ghost where, you know, all the things that have happened to other people, I've been pushed downstairs and slapped and pinched. Yeah. And like, I'll, I'll take all of Anything. that, any of it. <laughs> one, give me one thing. Yeah. But, Oh, that's, un I hope you do see something at some point. I like, too. yeah, keep <laughs> if I ever see any, you know, we'll send them your way. <laughs> yeah. In fact, in fact, in um, the paranormal forensics book, uh, which I call blood and ghosts. And I wrote with Mark Nesbitt. I mean, we have a medium telling me that the ghost of Danny Hansford from midnight in the garden of good and evil is trying to tell me something. I'm like, okay, come on. Like he, he has this, <laughs> whole big story that he's he's put into a bottle and sunk in some water and he wants me to go get it and but the you know the mediums always just get right to the point of being tell me where it is but then up oh, he stopped talking you know to me that's that's kind of fake yeah because yeah. if he can tell you all the rest he can tell you that I've never gone to one at this point so I always was intrigued just to see what they would say but yeah I've never gone to one um I know one of the other books that I looked at online was you have Cemetery Stories, Haunted Graveyards, Embalming Secrets, and the Life of a Corpse After Death. That one really intrigued me. And I wanted to know where you got the idea of that book from. And huh. concerning what I was reading about it, it said that it discusses stitching and cosmetic secrets used on mutilated bodies. I was wondering what were some of the most interesting things you learned while doing research for this book? And was there like anything really weird that just like blew your mind when you like discovered it? Well, that was actually an idea of an editor. Okay. Who wanted a book like that. And he thought, because I'm a small person, I was non-threatening and I'd be the perfect person to send out to get these stories. And that's really <laughs> how it started. Okay. 
fine, you know, give me give me an advance so I can go do that. And one of the first things I did was I uh, went to the Day of the Dead week in Oaxaca, Mexico, because I love mm-hmm. the dead stuff. So that was pretty cool. But I think uh, I went to a, um, a funeral director's convention and you can't oh. just get into those. No. The, the guy who was the organizer, he had a friend who had taken me as a teacher at the Maui Writers Conference. Mm-hmm. And he and she had given him Piercing the Darkness to read. And he said, oh. you respected them, so I will get you in. Nice. This. So that was great. And he not only got me in there, he got me into the Baltimore morgue where <sighs> about 11 autopsies were going on side by side. Wow. And uh, that was very interesting. That was uh, my first, because I was not in forensics yet. Mm -hmm. That was my first, but it was really the interesting stories they told, especially the people, the necrophiles. I was told that necrophiles would not talk to me, but they couldn't stop talking. I mean, they love an audience. They're chatty. They have a lot to say. So, so some of them were embalmers and Mm -hmm. probably one of my favorite this guy wasn't a necrophile but one of my favorite stories is when I went to this bed and breakfast and there was a guy there who's a a freelance embalmer okay so and he was so passionate about his work he just loved talking about all the stuff that he saw him and people he was in demand you know because he would travel he would go all these places wow um, and he was really a, an artist in what he could do. So that was pretty cool. So that, so I think I just discovered so many interesting aspects of the, not just the funeral world and the, mm-hmm. and, you know, death investigators and whatnot. It, just, it was just such a fascinating world. The, the taphophiles, the people who plan their entire vacations around what cemetery are they going to next? Um, I, I just love doing that book. It's one of my favorites. That's one of my favorite things when we, we usually go to England once a year, just because we have family, but because of COVID, we haven't for the last two years. And that's one of my favorite things to do is I like to go and take pictures in the old cemeteries because oh, yeah. we don't have old cemeteries here. So like, go to Highgate because they have a vampire there. <laughs> Highgate Cemetery. That's one yes. of the best of all the cemeteries, but I love the ones in Paris. they I went, I've been to I, Highgate. Highgate was amazing. It is amazing, but I still think I think Paris wins. Paris and oh, really? for cemeteries because well, Paris has I mean amazing. They have a lot of cemeteries, but they just have such fantastic artwork in these cemeteries. The mausoleums and the sculptures, mm-hmm. um, they're they're really quite quite awesome. But Rome, the it's called the non-Catholic cemetery. So it's right outside oh. of the gates. Beautiful. It's where Keats and uh, yeah. are buried. Full of cats everywhere. But <laughs> it's all terraced in this interesting way. It's just, oh, just okay. a beautifully kept cemetery. So I'm not a taphophile so much as that I need to see certain stones or something, but I do love going in cemeteries wherever I go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I think one of the oldest ones that I saw in England, I can't even remember the name. It was such a small place we were at was it had just a few graves, but it then had this tiny little church and it was built in 600 AD. And the fact that it was just still standing, you could go inside, walk around. The only thing they had a sign that said they changed over the years was they'd installed lights so people could go in and look. Um, but yeah, that's, I like it. It's just some of the old little ones. They're just amazing. And they're just quaint. It's quiet. You've got, you know, maybe 20 or 30 graves if that, and then, yeah. So I I like to do that, but yeah. Yeah. And so I wanted to move from vampires and the dead to something else that we know that you're famous for, for serial killers. (laughs) So you've written so many different books on the subject and, One of your books, Confession of a Serial Killer, The Untold Story of Dennis Rader, the BTK Killer, has an interesting backstory. Can you tell our viewers how this project came about? And can you elaborate on the extent of your research that you immersed yourself in for this world to do this book for this extreme offender? Still immersed because we're now doing a four-part A&E documentary on the book. That's, that would be really cool to watch. 
most of the BTK documentaries are about the investigation. This is this is on my book with him. Oh, okay. And that book I should just describe. I, I call it a guided autobiography because it's him talking, but about 85% is in his voice, except that it's structured in a specific way. So he's, he's just not talking about whatever he wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. In a way that will benefit criminology, forensic psychology, and law enforcement. Okay. So, so I guided what subject areas I would want him to talk about. And okay. It came about in a really bizarre way, as many of my projects do. Um, what had happened was when he was caught after 30 years in 2005, this other woman decided she wanted to write a book and she contacted him and they corresponded for about five years. Uh, I knew about her because I saw some newspaper coverage on her. And, and then I saw her on Facebook and said, well, whatever happened to your book on BTK? And she's, she knew who I was because she had a book <laughs> of mine, begged me to take it over. Begged oh, me. wow. Um, in part because she just felt overwhelmed by him and she had never written a book before. And okay. And I'd written a couple of biographies, so I knew there was a lot of work to it. I didn't know it would take me five years because that was, <laughs> and that was the attorney's fault. Um, but to me, it was, it was kind of interesting because I had just finished this book called The Mind of a Murderer, where I looked back over a century of mental health experts who had taken a lot of time to really get to know mm -hmm. an extreme offender, either a mass murderer or serial killer. And so, and, and so I had a book of, I guess, like 15 different people who had done that over the course of a century. And I had just published that book. So here was my opportunity to do exactly that. Wow. You know, not just a reporter, a mental health expert, somebody who, you know, it has interviewed people clinically, knows a lot about assessment, uh, knows how to interpret personality disorders and all of that. Um, and so here was my opportunity to actually do the same exact thing I had just talked about with other people. So, but then it was about a transfer from this other writer to me. He wasn't so sure he wanted to do that. Okay. So it kind of challenged me to uh, work within this. He had this, these codes that he wanted to work with. And so I had to solve the codes, you know, which is fine because that's all for me. <laughs> Part of it, great. That shows me a lot about who he is. Um, I kept Seppi kept forgetting what his codes meant. So in in the end, I made the code that we used for the book. And part of the code idea was that he didn't want the guards to know what he was working on. Mm -hmm. The open letters, but also because he he fancied himself as sort of a James Bond kind of spy. And so for him, this was kind of a game. Yeah. And so fine, I'll do, I'll do whatever it takes because my whole, um, some of my training, my clinical psychology training had been in phenomenology, which is to get as close to the raw experience as you can. You, yeah. you have to get out of the theories and the concepts that other people impose on the raw material of life experience. And you just go to back to the things themselves is really the, the, the phrase they use in that. So for me, it was really let, let this man speak, um, you know, within the, the guiding ideas because the victim's families are the ones who, who get the primary profits from this mm -hmm. and they had to approve me. And so when I wrote the proposal about what I was going to do, they yeah. did approve me. Other people had, had come forward, but they didn't want a tablet. They don't want anything out there, Yeah. Period. But if it was going to be something, they wanted something that would benefit as, as I wanted to do the professional community. So okay. they did approve me. Um, and so within that frame, I worked with him for a period of five years. Wow. And then, and then now recently, now it's been 11 years since we first got this you know, going. Um, this whole past year, I've been working on this a and &E documentary. I'm, I'm, a, a co-executive producer, but also the primary narrator and also the one wow. him to get his voice into it. And, you know, so it's been a um, rigorous and, and a very time-consuming project. 
is it probably going to come out next year do you think january january January. oh okay i was just told yesterday (laughs) yay wow okay it's four parts so two parts each night that's okay i love watching those kind of things i'm I'm an executive producer of another show murder house flip which what a blast that and that came out of my serial killer work can you tell me about that because i haven't heard of that one yeah um it well, well, it took us three years. We sold it three <laughs> times to different, different people. But um, I have a friend who used to be an executive producer for CSI. We met on a cruise to Alaska when I was teaching a writer's workshop there. <laughs> so everything is bizarre. Everything has a very strange origin. And we became friends. In a, and I won't go into the details because they're kind of private to him. But we became friends. And then at one point he said, oh, you know, I'm working for Sony now. And if you have some ideas, you know, send them to me. So I created this list of ideas I had for shows. And and at the bottom of the list, I put what I thought was a joke, Murder House Flip. And the way that came about was I was teaching my serial killers course. And I always start with juveniles. And we had um, juveniles who had committed a mat, uh, who had killed three of their family, two, two brothers and a cousin who had killed their father, mother, and brother. Okay. And that was pretty close to campus. So one of my students drove by it and said, oh, do you know that house is for sale? And talk about an aha moment, bang, bang, bang. But I, but I actually wrote it as a joke because <laughs> you know murder houses and suicide houses are stigmatized properties. So the yeah. idea was we're gonna go into the space and heal it because it's not the house's fault that somebody picked that house to murder somebody in. Mm-hmm. So we're going to go in and renovate and heal the murder space. And I put that in, in the bottom of my list and he, immediately, <laughs> I need this. I need this. You, I want you to develop a treatment. I want you to give me ideas. And, uh, and I, honestly, I, I pitched it to a lot of places in every single place. And this is one of the most original ideas we've had in a long time. ABC bought it, but then they, then they reneged on, on their mm-hmm. deal. Um, Netflix wanted it. Um, we've had a lot of people who wanted it. It ended up at Quibi, which was the quick bites idea where they were going to do five, these five minute segments. Okay. So the, the murder the renovation, the reveal. And then Qu- Quibi banked on not, no pandemic coming along. Yeah. Quibi banked on people, you know, running around and just having, you know, quick, so they wanted it on the phones. Mm-hmm. So they did the first season and then Quibi went down the tubes and uh, Roku got it. So okay. Roku is now about to launch us into our second season. So okay. It's called a Roku original. So if you have a Roku device, it's free to see. Yeah. It makes me think of, have you seen that? I say it's kind of corny, but they did one season and it finished earlier this year called Surreal Estate. Have you seen that show? Nope. It's, um, yeah, it's about these guys who are like <laughs> real estate agents, but all they get are all their clients seem to have like a haunted house and then they go in and they help with the haunted well, house. I've and seen, I've seen some of the rads involve the hauntings. This is really just about murder. Okay. Yeah. This is just like, um, you know, like you catch it on a Friday night and it's not like a real reno show or anything. It's just a regular TV show, but it was kind of corny. I don't know if they made a second season, but it made me think of that. Well, um, and, and really, ours should have been called Murder House Makeover because we aren't flipping these houses. We're making them over for the homeowners. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really it's really kind of touching to watch what happens when they come back into the space that they've been avoiding in their house. And now mm-hmm. our first one was a serial killer, Dorothy Puente, who wow. ran a boarding house and killed off these men on their social security so she could take the checks and she buried seven bodies in the yard. Wow. And when we were, um, the owners wanted us to come in, but they didn't want to change anything in the actual house. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, I bet you want a new yard. And they did. And they got <laughs> incredible reno, a beautiful reno. So everyone who we whose house we go into, they get really a very nice, complete remake and often a whole new backyard and 
Oh, that's cool. Stuff. So, so it's really, by the time you get to the reveal, it's very moving because they really never expected. Like one, one couple, um, they bought this, this blue house. It was an incredible deal you know, near the ocean. And turns out it's the blue murder house where the man not only murdered his wife in the, in the bathroom and, and, and dismembered her, but was cooking her on the stove when he was arrested. Wow. So, so <laughs> they had not changed that uh, bathroom out. And wow. The, the tile to, to redo the floor, there was blood under it. So, yeah. That's so cool. A beautiful new bathroom plus much, much, much other stuff. So it was, that to me was a really fun show because I thought it up and then mm -hmm. I watched this whole huge process of pit, creating it, pitching it. Adding Let alone up. the actual filming and doing it all. Yeah, that was exactly. just like, yeah. Yeah, it, so it was so cool. Cool. Um, and the last question I just wanted to ask about in regards to Raider, working with someone like that for so long and did you find it all, like, does that affect you at all for doing research like that? Or do you compartmentalize or how does it, like, does it affect you at all, anything? Like, well, you know, people ask me that a lot. I, I approach because I, I studied hundreds of serial yeah. killers. So he's not the worst by any means that I've ever, ever studied. Um, but it, to me, it's more clinical. I, okay. I don't go into it as like a, a true crime junkie or, you know, some people call themselves or aren't serial killers cool. I don't think they are. Um, mm -hmm. I also talk to the victim's family members so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm well aware of the horrible things he did and uh, not just to the victims but you know subsequently fragmenting and destroying families mm -hmm. um, and even his own family because he had kids and a wife and yeah so I always keep in mind the destructiveness of what they've done I don't think they're cool I don't think I don't think this is a a really neat thing. I don't, I don't think about, oh, I comfort myself with serial killer documentaries. Like you kind of see mm -hmm. people out there. It, it's never been that to me. I've always, it's for me, it's clinical. Okay. Uh, yeah. Most of my writing, in fact, has been about pioneering something, exploring something most people have not. And when I got into this in the late nineties, in the mid nineties, um, it was not a thing it no. wasn't like a big fun popular thing like that it is now and um so I've had a long time I've worked with FBI profilers I've, I've done consulting and death investigations uh it it doesn't bother me be, I guess because I've I've read so many case reports yeah um, you know, somebody asked me the other day well how many of these people have you interviewed I'm like it's not the point is not how many is how deep do you go do you yeah how far the, down the rabbit hole yeah do you look at the re police reports do you do you look at their confessions do you look at you know what people have said about them I mean how how large of a picture are you getting of them not how many who cares how many it's really the quality not yeah, not quantity. Yeah, of the material, and so because I've done so much immersion in it, really on a daily basis, um, encountering someone like BTK Dennis Rader wasn't any big deal to me. I was happy to take over the the book thing, mm -hmm. um, especially because there there was that aspect of the victims' families getting some benefit from that. Exactly, um, and also my ability to really you know, dig into this rich, raw material of a person's psyche who wanted me to do that, who wanted to explore it with me. Mm -hmm. um, I, it was a, it was a tremendous opportunity. Yeah. Um, would I do it again? I, I might be doing it again. I already have the next person I might be doing it with. Okay. Um, but it, it really was, it took far longer than I thought it was going to take. Yeah. I would have, most of my books, I'm usually writing three books a year. And that book took five years. All by I know when I saw that five years, I was like, wow. So yeah. it's, it's a so lot. I am 11 years later, still, mm -hmm. know, and I still talk to him regularly, write to him. Um, and it's fine. It doesn't, 
you know, they're not serial killers 24 seven. They're like, we watch TV shows and talk about them. And we yeah. read, he, he recently read To Kill a Mockingbird and wanted to talk about it. You know, <laughs> so and people find that hard to believe, but they're not, media has made them into these like larger than life, mon- thoroughly evil monsters. And, you know, that's really not exactly how they are. Mm-hmm. So it's not that hard to just talk to them. Yeah. Now, some are vulgar and I don't want to have anything to do with them. Yeah. Um, some are demanding, some are whiny, some are pretentious, certainly. Yeah. And I yeah. have nothing to do with them. Like I wouldn't have ever wanted to interview Charles Manson. I think he's a, he was a you know jerk, a very pretentious jerk. Um, I don't think I'd want to interview Keith Jesperson. I, again, very pretentious and constantly lying kind of a jerk so I'm in you know I'm in the I guess a privileged position of being able to decide yes or no I don't really have to talk to any of them I know um years ago because I've taken some criminology courses over the years at school and one of the best field trips we got to go on was I guess out here we got to go to a maximum security prison and sit and have oreos and coffee with lifers So it was an interesting experience because we got to sit there for like an hour. They had each of them at a different table and you just got to go around and, you know, hear their stories and just sit and chat with them. So sounds like, um, and they do have a lot to say. I mean, especially because, and I taught existential philosophy. So for me, always the idea of what your life is amounting to the ending of your life, when you know there's not going to be any way out this is this is the rest of your life every single day there's no hope Mm -hmm. there's no no real goals anymore uh what must that be like for a human being yeah no sense of momentum into the future except total monotony and the potential that you might get beat up or raped or something like that yeah i mean obviously it has it, it has such a an effect on them in a way that most people just don't know unless they do know an offender who's who's in prison for a long stretch. Um, certainly, we learn a lot about the human spirit from people like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that you've been in so many documentaries and all these different shows and projects going on. What do you think about the TV crime shows or films pertaining to serial killers? Like when I was growing up, like I loved Silence of the Lambs. And the other thing that popped into my head was um, Mindhunter from Netflix. I'm not sure if you've watched that one. Um, Or, you know, things like Dexter and things like, do you enjoy watching anything like that? Or for you, is it more like you prefer things that are not related to what you do when you like? I watch them because my students are watching them. But yeah. Um, I mean, I wrote the forensic science of CSI and the forensic psychology of criminal minds and Mm -hmm. the science of cold case files. So, of course, those things are part of what I do, what my livelihood as a writer. Um, But sometimes they bother me. I think Mindhunter bothered me the most because I know I worked with Ressler and Douglas and there were so many misstatements. Uh, Okay. Representations like Bob Ressler never had a kid who was a budding serial killer. That was horrifying. And his mm. wife was not at all like that. Okay. Uh, and also he's the one that proposed the prison program and it made him look like he was hesitant and maybe we shouldn't do this. So it kind of bugged me how they misrepresented. And also neither one of those guys started the profiling unit. <laughs> it was two other guys, Teton and Milani, and they're completely wiped out of that show. Out of the so, story, yeah. Out of the story completely. So people who watch that think they know the story and they don't know the story. And I, I'm personally offended by mm-hmm. you know, the, the misrepresentation of how it began. I know it's supposedly fiction, but but we do know it's based on on Wrestler and Douglas for the most part. And and they w- weren't the first ones into that unit. In fact, Wrestler was third, I think. Okay. Um, and so it bugs me, that kind of thing. But I do watch the fiction. I don't watch Dexter because I, I, I watched the first season. I thought it was so, so he's not a psychopath. Yeah. So guys don't worry about <laughs> the fact that they're different. Or they don't care. They mm-hmm. just like that. Um, 
so yeah, I'll watch them. I, I'll know what they're about at the very least. Yeah. Because I know that my students are watching them. Okay. When I talk about, you know, I have a whole class on, on extreme offenders, mass murderers, spree killers, serial killers, and I, and I cap it with serial killer culture. Okay. So certainly I know about all the stuff that's out there in the media, the movies, the novels, the this and that. Um, the ones that really rise to the top, like Silence of the Lambs, of course, I'll talk about that. And mm -hmm. in fact, I just did a, uh, a one of those things you see on YouTube where, where some expert talks about oh, okay. what's real in these movies. And I just did one. Oh, um, okay. And eight movie clips. So I talked about Hannibal Lecter and the guy in You and, you know, a few others and you know. Yeah, I've watched that. I watched the first season of You, so I don't think I I didn't well, I do the second one. I think he's a stalker with serial, with murder on the side. It's he's a stalker, and mm -hmm. I suppose he's not a classic serial killer by any means. Um, so that's what I said about that one. And I think that oh, I think it was only murders in the building. I said you know that's formulaic. Who done it? Mm -hmm. so, no, she's too chatty. <laughs> <laughs> and. What do you think of like the CSI shows and things like that? Do you, I, I know it kind of gives people, I think, a false sense of what goes on into an investigation with certain things, because then they're like, oh my God, everything's done. And it's like a day. And then they figured it out. They caught the guy and well, like, and I get I, it's TV, but. It, and I've worked with them. In fact, I will say, I'll give a story about CSI. Okay. I was in Hollywood and I, I told you I work with a former executive producer there and and so we were near the writer's room and they were working on a thing on forensic hypnosis okay and, and they asked me to come in would I because I have done hypnosis as a clinician and so they gave me this story about how this guy had hypnotized bank tell three bank tellers in in Europe and this is a news story okay so hand it said hypnotize them to hand over money and they wanted to know how that worked and I, I laughed I said they're in on it. <laughs> They're like, what? They changed to their credit. They changed their, their, their uh, plot for the show. Right. Okay. And quoted me in the show a few times because it was su such an eye-opening thing for them to realize, uh, oh, oh, oops. <laughs> don't you think if that's the way it worked, a lot more people would be using that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of banks would be broke, you know, there'd be so much money gone and yeah. yeah so that was that was kind of fun but you know of course they're not realistic and mm -hmm. in some ways they've done a disservice to forensic science because you don't have crime lab people running around with the detectives knowing who the suspect is or not that, that destroy and that gives you bias that destroys scientific neutrality mm -hmm. that's not that really is not the way it is and of course that trickles into juries and the kinds of things that they're demanding from prosecutors and defense attorneys. And so it kind of messed up and still, still is having an impact on the court system. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I know prosecutors who do a lot more tests than they need to do just because they know the jury is going to ask about it and expect it. And oh, okay. There was a judge who told me once that the jury acquitted someone because, because uh, the investigators hadn't fingerprinted the grass like okay they don't even do that on CSI <laughs> I was gonna say no I've never seen that 12 one 12 people all believe that was a good idea wow but that's what happened so so yeah it, I mean it's it's interesting but I think I know that it's just entertainment yeah and even when I've been when I was working with because I, I sold a show to um, CBS one year. And, and the day I handed in the, the pilot, the economy tanked. Oh, <laughs> so, not good timing. <laughs> yeah, we quit me going down the tubes. And I'm, I'm beginning to think, you know, I really am a ghost propellant of some kind. <laughs> but but um, yeah, they asked me to do absurd things. They wanted me to find out how 
DNA would prove that bees that were released into the desert had been out there for 30 days. And I, I said, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> DNA doesn't do that. It doesn't do that. But they wanted you to figure it out. <laughs> they wanted me that because they wanted that to be a plot. So they wanted me to figure out how that would work. Okay. okay. And that taught me a lot about <laughs> expectations. <laughs> And that was probably the day I realized this is really about reality. This is really no, true. no, it's it's one of those things where you know how can we kind of make it slightly feasible and people will believe it. And, and yeah, and even when I was when I was writing um, the the forensic science of CSI, mm-hmm. um, and also that came out the day before 9-11. Oh, oh my <laughs> so. god. You just have weird luck going on with dates <laughs> and weird. everything. <laughs> but it's not right. But <laughs> I talked to a lot of experts at that time who said that, you know, the CSI research team had called them mm-hmm. and they'd given a lot of detail and then, and then they were ignored. So, I mean, I, I just told you my experience. They didn't ignore me when I told them stuff, but really plot drives everything so if it's yeah. a plot point i i consulted for the alienist and told them one of the things they wanted to do wasn't mm-hmm. feasible you know bye-bye to <laughs> me. <laughs> it's not, they wanted to do it and and that's that it was entertaining and they didn't really care if they couldn't do it and and i find that to, and it wasn't this is not about them i find that to be true whenever i visit hollywood i see that a lot and, yeah. and they do justify it with, it's just entertainment. We're not saying this is real. And that's true. But unfortunately, audiences don't often know the difference. Well, it's it's funny. I recently was fortunate to be um, interviewed for a documentary that was on Discovery. And it was about the Highgate vampire, funny enough, that we talked about earlier. And I'd never been interviewed for anything like that. And it was it was kind of a weird experience, but eye-opening because I've watched so many documentaries, but the fact that, you know, people came to my house, how long they were here, all the questions, all the talking, and then what makes it into it. So, yeah. So I found that as a very eye-opening experience. And I think it kind of gave me more of an appreciation for documentaries now when I watch them. So, but yeah, just the fact that you've done so many of them and it's weird because yeah, like anything with Hollywood and different films, it's like they kind of get the answer they want, or you know, it's like, well, we'll just move on because we know we want it this way. So. Yeah, after I did an unsolved mysteries once for the Lizzie Borden house, and yeah, I said to them, do not say that I said this, there's a ghost here. Mm-hmm. And I said, You'll never, you'll never get me on camera saying that. So they just put it in the words of my mouth because it's what they wanted me to say. Like, uh, like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have <laughs> either you do the documentaries and live with that or you don't do them? You, I know. You're not going to get them to do what you want to do. You're going to, you're you're either going to be there to fulfill a role mm-hmm. um, or you just don't do them. Yeah. And at least with the one you said coming out in January that being the executive producer, I would think you'd at least have more. No, no p- more pull than normal. <laughs> no. Okay. I was going to, okay. I'm totally wrong on that, but well, I do. I, ha- I certainly have input because it's my book. Okay. And, you know, if I think a question or a phrasing is not the way I would say something, I'll say that. Okay. But I don't have any say on the final cut. None okay. All. Never mind. I was making an assumption. <laughs> Um, so we're almost out of time, but just the last few things I wanted to ask was, can you tell us about, you said you have a new book coming out soon? Was it, you showed me, or was that a recent book? Uh, that's a recent one that came out during the pandemic. Oh, okay. Um, Can you guys, can you tell us about that one? Yeah, it's called How to Catch a Killer. And it was, it's about 30 serial killers who've been caught. Okay. I think I have five or six categories. So one is for, you know, forensic science innovations. One is, you know, top-notch police work. One is 
um, they made a mistake and that's what got them caught. Another category was they turned themselves in. That's a small category. I was going to say, yeah. Very small. Um, there are a few. So, so within those, are a witness was part of it, um, survivor or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's really about, you know, it, it kind of starts with the case. It's almost like a whodunit format. And then how do they figure it out? And how did they catch the person? So that's, that's the book. And okay. the next one that will come out, I believe, will be the first in a series, a novel series, where I have a forensic psychologist yeah. who runs a PI agency. So she has a little cast of characters as part of her team. And she also has a number of consultants, forensic consultants. And she takes on, she runs the agency called the Nutcrackers because they take on <laughs> cases that are hard nuts to crack, including okay. paranormal cases. And like me, she's a ghost repellent. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds fun. Is that coming out next year? Yeah, do you think? Coming out in August, next August, yeah. Cool. Okay. We'll have to keep our eyes open for that. Um, but otherwise, uh, that's all the questions I have. So I wanted to thank you so much. I know we had a very lengthy talk today, um, <laughs> but I was just, I'm really excited that you came on. I had, and there's so many other questions I didn't even get into. So maybe at some point we could have you back on again. Okay. Um, hopefully I didn't overwhelm you and ask you too many yeah. things. No, I thought those are good questions and yeah. good coverage of a lot of what I've done. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, it's been amazing. And otherwise, I just want to thank everyone from home. Thank you for tuning in tonight. And again, this has been Catherine Ramslin. Um, we're going to put some links below if you need to check out some of her books, or you can see some of her projects upcoming. So just check out in the description for that. And otherwise, make sure to like this video and hit the subscribe button below. And that's it for Morbid Planet tonight. So I'm Erin Chapman. Stay safe and stay morbid. Bye for now.